Assisted suicide is nothing more than legalized murder. And things are getting worse. A lot worse. As time went by, procedures and protocols have gotten progressively worse to resemble more like Nazi Germany and a lot less than the purported right to dignity that the advocates keep on spouting. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, let's talk about euthanasia a bit more. Last time I talked about this was in July 2015 when I tackled a case from Belgium. Now, as an update to that particular video, that particular individual eventually did not die and is still alive today as she changed her mind. But the Belgian law did agree that she should be killed because she says so. At least in her case, the doctors did abide by her wish to stay alive. A Dutch lady recently was not that lucky as she was murdered by her doctors even as she was fighting against the doctors for her life. And the panel of experts said, well, that's not exactly wrong. Coming from the Telegraph, panel clears Dutch doctor who asked family to hold patient down as she carried out euthanasia procedure. Short article and I'll leave uh, longer versions in the low bar for those who want all the details of the story. Quote, a Dutch woman doctor who asked an elderly, elderly patient's family to hold her down while she administered the fatal drug dose has been cleared under Holland's euthanasia laws. Mail Online reported that the patient fought desperately in an attempt not to be killed. Jacob Konstam, chairman of the Regional Review Committee, which considered the case, said, quote, I am convinced that the doctor acted in good faith and we would like to see more clarity on how such cases are handled in the future, close quote. As a result, the case will be considered by Dutch courts to clarify the law over whether doctors who carry out euthanasia on patients with dementia should face prosecution if they acted in good faith. Euthanasia has been legal in the Netherlands for 17 years and more than 5,500 patients have undergone the procedure. In this case, the woman who was suffering from dementia had earlier expressed a desire to have her life ended when she felt the time was right. According to case notes, the woman who lived in a nursing home showed signs of fear and anger. She would also wander around the premises at night. The end came when a doctor put a sporific uh, into her coffee before administering a, a lethal injection. But as the doctor tried to administer the injection, she began to struggle and the doctor had to seek the family's help to complete the procedure. Details of the case emerged as the Dutch consider uh, charges, changes in the law which would give anyone over 75 the right to assisted suicide. As I was saying, longer versions of the story are in the low bar, including the original review by the Euthanasia Commission. The PDF is, of course, in the Dutch language. I had a Dutch friend of mine to read and translate out loud portions of it to me. It is, quite frankly, a psychopathic review of murder in cold blood. Nothing more and nothing less. The thing is, this wasn't always the case. This is a progression towards moral darkness that is going on in the Netherlands and Belgium and other jurisdictions. Here's what I was saying back in July 2015. The common argument against which what I just said is usually in this form. Oh, but it only applies to terminally ill patients, particularly those who can't do it themselves, and it usually involves rather passive moves, such as withdrawing medical services that essentially keep the patient alive. This argument at a first glance may seem reasonable, except that pesky thing called reality tends to refuse to work that way as the overwhelming majorities of the cases are not so clear-cut as the poster child cases used by the activists to push for such legislation. Now this is how this policy is being sold to the general public. In fact, when I posted about this in my private group, a fine conservative neurologist fired back at me with a case of Lou Gehring disease, which is a horrific disease, let's be clear about that, 
that he saw and where he was asked for guidance concerning assisted suicide. Now, he couldn't do anything about it because such thing is illegal in this country and it's 25 to life if you get caught. But his point was that there are, there definitely are situations where such thing as assisted suicide is at the very least worth considering, if not definitely in order. Now, I would love to agree with that view, but I simply cannot, because reality prevents me from doing that. You see, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. This is a motto that I take very, very seriously. The trade-off proposed by those who think assisted suicide should be legal says that those who are terminally ill and bound to die a slow and painful death within weeks or months uh, should be allowed the dignity of dying an easy death surrounded by their loved ones in their own terms. And whilst doctors shouldn't be forced to perform such uh, uh, kills, they should definitely be allowed to assist if they so wish, and there is indisputable consent from the patient. That's usually the argument for this thing. And you know what? That would be fine. In fact, the theoretical framework of this issue sounds quite fine, or at the very least, acceptable. The problem, however, is that we shouldn't discuss policy in an ideal, or should I say idealized, best case scenario, but rather discuss policy in relation to the real world and how it works in reality. As with any other policy, we should subject it to the Thomas Sowell test, namely, compared to what, at what cost, and what hard evidence do you have? Now, to answer basically all three of the questions, let's head to a very serious source, the National Institute of Health, and read this review by Jay Pereira, Legalizing Euthanasia or Assisted Suicide, The Illusion of Safeguards and Controls. Now, the author of this review is actually in favor of euthanasia, just like my conservative neurologist friend. The problem for this author is the same problem that I have, namely that reality doesn't match theory. To make this review even scarier, I will inform you in advance that this was written in 2011, six years ago, before struggling grannies began being held down by the family and then executed by doctors, like it happened in the Netherlands in the current year. The article is very long, but I selected quite large chunks uh, to read to you because as normal people and as conservatives, that's how we should think about policy. Always ask for precedents and carefully examine how things went in the past somewhere else before importing a policy in our own areas. So, without further ado, let's dive in from the abstract quote. The present paper provides evidence that these laws and safeguards are regularly ignored and transgressed in all the jurisdictions and that transgressions are not prosecuted. For example, about 900 people annually are administered lethal substances without having given explicit consent, and in one jurisdiction almost 50% of the cases of euthanasia are not reported. Increased tolerance of transgressions in societies with such laws represents a social slippery slope, as do changes to the laws and criteria followed uh, legalization. Although the initial intent was to limit in euthanasia and assisted suicide to last resort option for a very small number of terminally ill people, some jurisdictions now extend the practice to newborns, children and people with dementia. A terminal illness is no longer a prerequisite. In the Netherlands, euthanasia for anyone over the age of 70 who is tired of living is now being considered. Legalizing euthanasia and assisted suicide therefore places many people at risk, affects the values of society over time, and does not provide controls and safeguards. Alright, so let's go through uh, a little bit of short history from the introduction. Quote, To date, that is, till 2011, the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg have legalized euthanasia. The laws in the Netherlands and Luxembourg allow PAS, that is, Physician Assisted Suicide. Uh, in the United States, the states of Oregon and Washington legalized PASS in 1997 and 1999, respectively, but euthanasia remains illegal. In the Netherlands, uh, euthanasia and PASS were formally legalized in 2001, after about 30 years of public debate. 
Since the 1980s, guidelines and procedures for performing and controlling euthanasia have been developed and adapted several times by the Royal Dutch Medical Association in collaboration with the country's judicial system. Despite opposition, including that uh, from the Belgium Medical Association, Belgium legalized euthanasia in 2002 after about three years of public discourse that included government commissions. The law was guided by the Netherlands and Oregon experiences, and the public was assured that any defects in the Dutch law would be addressed in the Belgian law. Luxembourg legalized euthanasia and passed in 2009. Switzerland is an exception in that assisted suicide, although not formally legalized, is tolerated as a result of a loophole in a law dating back to the early 1900s that decriminalizes suicide. Euthanasia, however, is illegal. A person committing suicide may do so with assistance as long as the assistant has no selfish motives and does not stand to gain personally from the death. Unlike other jurisdictions that require euthanasia or assisted suicide to be performed only by physicians, Switzerland allows non-physicians to assist suicide. In all these jurisdictions, safeguards, criteria and procedures were put in place to control the practices, to ensure societal oversight and to prevent euthanasia and pass from being abused or misused. Some criteria and procedures are common across these jurisdictions, others vary from country to country. The extent to which these controls and safeguards have been able to control the practices and to avoid abuse merits closer inspection, particularly by jurisdictions contemplating the legalization of euthanasia and pass. The present paper explores the effectiveness of the safeguards and the slippery slope phenomenon. Chapter 2. Safeguards and their effectiveness in all jurisdictions, the request for euthanasia and or pass has to be voluntary, well considered, informed and persistent over time. The requesting person must provide explicit written consent and must be competent at the time the request is made. Despite the, those safeguards, more than 500 people in the Netherlands are euthanized involuntarily every year. In 2005, a total of 2,410 deaths by euthanasia or pass were reported, representing 1.7% of all deaths in the Netherlands. More than 560 people, or 0.4% of all deaths, were administered lethal substances without having given explicit consent. For every five people euthanized, one is euthanized without having given explicit consent. Attempts at bringing those cases to trial have failed providing evidence that the judicial system has become more tolerant over time of such transgressions. In Belgium, the rate of involuntary and non-voluntary euthanasia deaths, that is, without explicit consent, is three times higher than it is in the Netherlands. Involuntary euthanasia refers to a situation in which a person possesses the capacity but has not provided consent, and non-voluntary euthanasia to a situation in which a person is unable to provide consent for reasons such as severe dementia or coma. A recent study found that in the Flemish part of Belgium, 66 of 208 cases of euthanasia, or 32%, occurred in the absence of request or consent. The reasons for not discussing the decision to end the person's life and not obtaining consent were that patients were comatose, 70% of cases, or had dementia, 21% of cases. In 17% of cases, the physicians uh, proceeded without consent because they felt that euthanasia was clearly in the patient's best interest, and in 8% of cases, that discussing it with the patient would have been harmful to that patient. Those findings ac accord with the results of a previous study in which 25 of 1,644 non-sudden deaths had been the result of euthanasia without explicit consent. Some proponents of euthanasia contend that the foregoing figures are misrepresentative because many people may have at some time in their lives expressed a wish for or support of euthanasia, albeit not formally. The counterargument is that the legal requirement for explicit written consent is important if abuse and misuse are to be avoided. After all, written consent has become essential in med medical research when participants are to be subjected to an intervention, many of which pose far lesser mortality risks. Recent history is replete with examples of abuse of medical research in the absence of explicit informed consent. Subchapter 2.2 Mandatory Reporting 
Reporting is mandatory in all the jurisdictions, but this requirement is often ignored. In Belgium, nearly half of all cases of euthanasia are not reported to the Federal Control and Evaluation Committee. Legal requirements were more frequently not met in unreported cases than in reported cases. A written request for euthanasia was more often absent, 88% versus 18%. Physicians speci specialized in palliative care were consulted less often, 55% versus 98%, and the drugs were more often administered by a nurse, 41% versus 0%. Most of the unreported cases, 92% of them, involved acts of euthanasia but were not perceived to be euthanasia by the physician. In the Netherlands, at least 20% of cases of euthanasia go unreported. That number is probably conservative because it represents only cases that can be traced. The actual number may be as high as 40%. Although reporting rates have increased from pre-legalization in 2001, 20% represents several hundred people annually. Again, this review was written in 2011. Things are just much worse now. Hundreds upon hundreds of innocent people are murdered by doctors just in the Netherlands alone, because the doctors think that it is in the best interest of the patients. I mean, just think about this for a second. The myriad of ways this can be abused, and probably is already abused. <sighs> anyway, let's skip a bit more and go straight to chapter 3, the slippery slope argument. Quote, the slippery slope argument, a complex uh, legal and philosophical concept, generally asserts that one exception to a law is followed by more exceptions until a point is reached that would initially have been unacceptable. The slippery slope argument has, uh, however, several interpretations, some of which are not germane to the euthanasia discussion. The interpretation pr proposed by Kohn in 2002 appear very relevant, however. He refers to these collectively as a practical slippery slope, although the term social slippery slope may be more applicable. The first interpretation postulates that acceptance of one sort of euthanasia will lead to another, even less acceptable forms of euthanasia. The second contends that euthanasia and pass, which originally would be regulated as a uh, last result option in only very select situations, could, over time, become less of a last resort and be sought more quickly, even becoming a first choice in some cases. The circumvention of safeguards and laws with little if any uh, prosecution provides some evidence of the social slippery slope phenomenon described by Kuhn. Till now, no cases of euthanasia have been sent to the judicial authorities for further investigation in Belgium. In the Netherlands, 16 cases, or 0.21% of all notified cases, were sent to the judicial authorities in the first four years after the euthanasia law came into effect. Few were investigated and none were prosecuted. In one case, a counselor who provided advice to a non-terminally ill person on how to commit suicide was acquitted. There has therefore been an increasing tolerance toward transgressions of the law, indicating a change in societal values after legalization of euthanasia and assisted suicide. In the 1987 preamble to its guidelines for euthanasia, the Royal Dutch Medical Association had written, quote, If there is no request from the patient, then proceeding with the termination of his life is juristically a matter of murder or killing and not of euthanasia, close quote. By 2001, the association was supported, supportive of the new law in which a written wish in an advanced uh, directive for euthanasia would be acceptable, and it is tolerant of non-voluntary and involuntary euthanasia. However, basing a request on an advanced directive or living will may be ethically problematic because the request is not contemporaneous with the act and may not be evidence of the will of the patient at the time euthanasia is carried out. Initially, in the 1970s and 1980s, euthanasia and pass advocates in the Netherlands made the case that these acts would be limited to a small number of terminally ill patients experiencing intolerable suffering and that the practices would be considered last result options only. By 2002, euthanasia laws in neither Belgium nor the Netherlands limited euthanasia to persons with a terminal disease, 
recognizing that the concept of terminal is in itself open to interpretation and errors. The Dutch law requires only that a person be, quote, suffering hopelessly and unbearably, close quote. Suffering is defined as both physical and psychological, which includes people with depression. In Belgium, the law ambiguously states that the person must be in a hopeless medical situation and be constantly suffering physically and psychologically, close quote. By 2006, the Royal Dutch Medical Association had declared that, quote, being over the age of 70 and tired of living should be an acceptable reason for requesting euthanasia. That change is most concerning in light of evidence of elder abuse in many societies, including Canada, and evidence that a large number of frail elderly people and terminally ill patients already feel a sense of being a burden on their families and society, and a sense of isolation. The concern that these people may feel obliged to access euthanasia or pass if it were to become available is therefore not unreasonable, although evidence to verify that concern is not currently available. In Oregon, although a terminal illness with a prognosis of less than six months to live has to be uh, present, intolerable suffering that cannot be relieved uh, is not a basic requirement, again recognizing that the concept of intolerable suffering is in itself ambiguous. This definition enables physicians to assist in suicide without inquiring into the source of the medical, uh, psychological, social, and existential concerns that usually underlie requests for assisted suicide. Physicians are required to indicate that palliative care is a feasible alternative, but are not required to be knowledgeable about how to relieve physical or emotional suffering. Until 2001, the Netherlands allowed only adults to access euthanasia or pass. However, the 2001 law allowed for children aged 12 to 16 years to be euthanized if consent is provided by their parents, even though this age group is generally not considered capable of making such decisions. The law even allows physicians to proceed with euthanasia even if there is disagreement between the parents. By 2005, the Groningen Protocol, which allows uh, euthanasia of newborns and younger children who are expected to have, quote, no hope of a good quality of life, close quote, was implemented. In 2006, legislators in Belgium announced their intention to change the euthanasia law to include infants, teenagers, and people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. In Belgium, some critical care specialists have opted to ignore the requirement that in the case of non-terminally ill patients, an interval of one month is required from the time of the first request until the time the, that euthanasia is performed. One specialist reported that in his unit, the average time from admission until euthanasia was performed for patients that seemed to be in a hopeless situation was about 3.5 days. Beneficians, this specialist argued, uh, was the overriding principle. Initially, euthanasia in the Netherlands was to be a last resort option, in the absence of other treatment options. Surprisingly, however, palliative care consultations are not mandatory in the jurisdictions that allow euthanasia or assisted suicide, even though uncontrolled pain and symptoms remain among the reasons for requesting euthanasia or pass. Requests by the Belgian palliative care community to include an obligatory palliative care consultation or palliative filter were denied. From 2002 to 2007 in Belgium, a palliative care physician was consulted, a uh, second opinion, in only 12% of all cases of euthanasia. Palliative care physicians and teams were not involved in the care of more than 65% of cases receiving euthanasia. Moreover, the rates of palliative care involvement have been decreasing. In 2002, palliative care teams were consulted in 19% of euthanasia cases, but by 2007 such involvement had declined to 9% of cases. That finding contradicts claims that in Belgium legalization has been accompanied by significant improvements in palliative care in the country. Other studies have reported even lower palliative care involvement. It must be noted that legalization of euthanasia or pass has not been required in uh, uh, other countries uh, such as the United Kingdom, Australia, Ireland, France and Spain, in which palliative care has developed more than it has in Belgium and the Netherlands. 
Skipping a bit, originally it was the view of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, the, the Royal Dutch Medical Association and the Ministers of Justice and Health that euthanasia would not be an option in situations in which alternative treatments were available but the patient had refused them. When this view conflicted with the accepted ethical principle that patients are allowed to refuse a treatment option, the law was altered to allow access to euthanasia even if the person refused another available option such as uh, palliative or psychiatric care. One consequence of the change is that the appropriateness of suicide prevention programs may begin to be questioned, because people wanting to commit suicide should, on the basis of autonomy and choice, have the same rights as those requesting euthanasia. There are other examples that a social slippery slope phenomenon does indeed exist. In Switzerland in 2006, the University Hospital in Geneva reduced its already limited palliative care staff to 1.5 from 2 full-time physicians after a hospital decision to allow assisted suicide. The community-based palliative care service was also closed. Of physicians in the Netherlands, 15% have expressed concern that economic pressures may prompt them to consider euthanasia for some of their patients. A case has already been cited the, of a dying patient who was euthanized to free a hospital bed. This is death panels, folk. Ah, there is evidence that attracting doctors to train uh, in and provide palliative care was made more difficult because of access to euthanasia and pass, received, uh, perceived by some to present easier solutions because providing palliative care requires competencies and emotional and uh, time com commitments on the part of the clinician. At the United Kingdom's parliamentary hearings on euthanasia a few years ago, one Dutch physician asserted that, quote, we don't need palliative medicine, we practice euthanasia, close quote. Compared with euthanasia cases, cases without an explicit request were more likely to have a shorter length of treatment of the terminal illness. Advocates of euthanasia have largely ignored these concerns about the social slippery slope and have opted to refute the slippery slope argument on the basis that legalizing euthanasia and pass has not led to exponential increases in cases of euthanasia or pass or in a disproportionate number of vulnerable persons being euthanized. However, there is evidence that challenges these assertions. And then the author goes on to bring very, very detailed numbers for each region. We'll skip that for time constraints and jump straight to chapter 5 summary. In 30 years, the Netherlands has moved uh, from euthanasia of people who are terminally ill to euthanasia of those who are chronically ill, from euthanasia of, for physical illness to euthanasia for mental illness, from euthanasia for mental illness to euthanasia for, for psychological distress or mental suffering, and now to euthanasia simply if a person is over 70 and tired of living. Dutch euthanasia protocols have also moved from conscious patients providing explicit consent to unconscious patients unable to provide consent. Denying euthanasia or pass in the Netherlands is now considered a form of discrimination against people with chronic illness, whether the illness be physical or psychological, because those people will be forced to quote unquote, suffer longer than those who are terminally ill. Non-voluntary euthanasia is now being justified by appealing to the social duty of citizens and the ethical pillar of beneficence. In the Netherlands, euthanasia has moved from being a measure of last resort to being one of early intervention. Belgium has followed suit, and troubling evidence is emerging from Oregon, specifically with respect to the protection of people with depression and the objectivity of the process. The United Nations has found that the euthanasia law in the Netherlands is in violation of its Universal Declaration of Human Rights because of the risk it poses to the right of, uh, uh, to the right of safety and integrity of every person's life. The UN has also expressed concern that the system may fail to detect and to prevent situations in which people could be subjected to undue pressure to access or to provide euthanasia and could circumvent the safeguards that are in place. Autonomy and choice are important values in any society, but they're not without limits. 
Our democratic societies have many laws that limit individual autonomy and choice so as to protect the larger community. These include, among many others, limits on excessive driving speeds and the obligation to contribute by way of personal and corporate income taxes. Why then should the different standards on autonomy and choice apply in the case of euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide? Legislators in several uh, countries and jurisdictions have, in the last year, voted against legalizing euthanasia and pass, in part because of the concerns and evidence described in this paper. Those jurisdictions include France, Scotland, England, South Australia and New Hampshire. They have, been, they have opted to improve palliative care services and to educate health professionals and the public. So yeah. Now, the reason I read so much of this article, well, actually, there's two reasons. One, because I know uh, many of my viewers don't read very long links and would prefer to listen. And two, because this is an article that goes very deep into the issue and it's also thoroughly referenced. Since 2011, things have gotten progressively worse. Now, more than 3% of all deaths in the Netherlands are by lethal injection, dubbed as assisted suicide. And the fact that a patient can require euthanasia, uh, a parent, sorry, can require euthanasia for their child and the doctor can proceed even if the other parent disagrees is terrifying. And this practice has spread. Belgium became the first country in the world to legalize voluntary euthanasia without any age limit. Just think about that. A confused teenager in an age-specific crisis, as most teenagers go through, could go and require to be euthanized. The fans of this law will tell you the old story that it only applies to it only applies to those who quote face unbearable physical suffering and make repeated requests to die unquote. But as the practice has already shown in Belgium, this standard. Uh, amounts to almost nothing. The actual application is, a, is basically to everyone who requests it. Remember, Belgium is the country where the public was told that only terminally ill patients would be considered, yet in practice there was no problem to approve the requests of a perfectly healthy young adults in their 20s. As evidence suggests, there is little to no doubt that the same consideration will be extended to children as well. This is a very difficult video to make for sure. I mean, seriously, regardless of where you stand morally on this issue, the facts are the same. In practice, this right to dignity claptrap means an ever increasing killing machine. That's really what it is. Regardless of whether you believe terminally ill patients should have the option or not, and that the doctors should have the option to oblige without fear of prosecution or not, the reality is that in every single case of country or jurisdiction that allowed this, things have degenerated really fast into Nazi-era type of executions. I mean, I hate to pull a Godwin on you, but this really is how things are happening in reality, rather than the idealized theoretical world in which the advocates of this measure seem to live in. The more evidence piles up on uh, this issue, the harder it gets to simply say, well, I don't know, it's a complicated issue. Well, it may be a complicated issue on a philosophical level. But on a policy and practical level, it's not complicated at all. This is an industry of mass murder. To make things more depressing, 75% of Belgians agree even with euthanasia on children. Another nail in the coffin of democracy, if you ask me. The slippery slope case ceases to be a fallacy and the, sec the second evidence for the existence of the slippery slope emerges. And at this point, the only question is how big is the pile of evidence for the slippery slope and how pervasive it is. Because the slippery slope is real. And it creates terrible moral hazards for everyone. Because again, most of these killings take place on taxpayers' shekels. You are literally forced to pay for the execution of your fellow citizen who did nothing wrong and harmed nobody.
So, bottom line, even if we are to agree in principle that there are certain clear-cut cases where an individual would for sure die a slow and painful death within the next let's say, three to five months, and there is a 100% guarantee that this fate cannot be avoided, even if we are to agree that in such cases, assisted suicide is the lesser evil, but evil nonetheless, mind you, that still doesn't provide any answer to the incontrovertible fact that wherever this is allowed, it quickly degenerates into a state-sponsored killing machine of anyone a doctor or a family deems undesirable. This is the real cost of the policy, and I presented the evidence for it. What's left to answer in the Thomas Sowell test is the compared to what part, and that's simple. Compared to the overwhelming majority of countries and jurisdictions around the world, both developed and undeveloped, where old granny isn't held down by the family whilst the doctor executes her. As things stand right now under the evidence examined, I cannot, in good conscience, endorse such a policy. I am willing to change my mind if new evidence emerges. That new evidence would have to suggest that such horrifying cases are significantly fewer than they are now and that mistakes are harshly prosecuted and end in jail time for the doctor who commits the mistake. Until that new evidence emerges, if it will ever emerge. The trade-off now is to provide merciful dignity for a few serious cases and pretend that the rest of the cases that, are, uh, that exist are nothing more than a first-degree murder. We have to pretend that those don't exist for the sake of the dignity of a few cases. I'm sorry, but that's not an acceptable trade-off. And with all of that being said, thank you for watching, thank you for your continuous and generous support, and... Uh, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.